Hi, this is Pitts with RPI Consultants. Uh, I'm a senior solution architect on the RPI team. Been with RPI for about two years now. I've supported new and existing Perceptive, OnBase, and Cofax projects, primarily focused within the healthcare space. Today we'll be covering the Perceptive Content Workflow basics and best practices. Workflow allows you to route a document or folder through business processes from start to finish with a customizable set of options. Um, it's a pretty robust tool. It's very flexible. It's something that almost every Perceptive client uses. Almost all of your workflow configurations will live within the Perceptive Content Workflow Designer, which is what we'll be walking through today. Some of the settings I like to have set up when I work with the Workflow Designer is really just the toggle on my grid. Um, and then make sure everything is snapped to grid, which is the second option here. What that allows you to do is kind of organize um, your workflow so that it's a lot more, um, a lot better laid out. Um, and then in case, you know, another uh, admin um, needs to get into this workflow, things are kind of laid out logically. Um, and it's a lot cleaner. Um, some of these next options here just allow um, you to to choose how you want these routes to display while they're placed onto the workflow designer itself. Um, there's some zoom options here, and then there's a couple more um, text box options um, that are presented here. You'll notice within this example I have up, um, I have a combination of containers, comment boxes, and text boxes in order to achieve this kind of look here. Um, this big gray box here is what Perceptive calls a container. Um, it's really just a, a giant gray box. Um, once you have that selected, you have a lot more properties here that allow you to kind of change the color of the background and of the border. Um, the other two options that are left up here, this is your comment box and then these are your text boxes. Uh, the difference between the two is the comment box kind of looks like this with a white background um, and a border. Your text box is really just a free floating text field um, the way you can kind of choose the the font and the font sizes, um, I like to use my text boxes as headers um, and then my comment boxes just to place those um, around the workflow to kind of give the, the admin a good idea of what's happening without actually digging in too far into those scripts. Um, Another thing I like to do with my workflow is color code the items. Um, within this particular workflow, the queues that are kind of surrounded in blue are the end user queues. Um, those are manual queues where end users are going to be assigned to uh, for them to work. Um, the gray queues are automated queues. So those are uh, documents or folders are going to flow into those queues, but those are all automated. Uh, some sort of script or back end processing is what's pushing those along. Um, while the end user queues are waiting for an end user action in order to move that forward. Now, uh, talking about queues, um, you'll notice inside of these queues in the top left corner, um, that symbol is going to denote which type of queue um, is being uh, used currently for that specific queue. Here, the top three um, that I commonly use are work queues, super queues, and system queues. Um, everything else is a pretty specific queue used for a specific task. For example, content queue allows you to submit a particular document to content server um, to get those OCR results. Um, integration server queue, um, so that allows you to submit those to like Envoy um, for a specific web service call. Um, but the main ones, again, are your work, your super, and your system queues. Uh, the work queue is a traditional workflow queue. You can assign users to this queue. You can assign some sort of script action to the queue. You can assign forms, application plans. Um, it's probably the most widely used queue here. Uh, the system queue is basically a work queue, but there is no security tied to the system queue. I try to not use those queues so often, um, even though all of these gray queues can technically be system queues. Um, the reason being if one day you decide that a super user and end user needs access to that particular queue if it's a system queue they won't have access to it and there's no way to change that um, so to do that in the future you would have to rebuild the queue as a work queue delete the system queue and kind of swap them out um, it's better just to start with work queues and then not assign security to them. It behaves essentially the same way um, between work and system. The other queue is a super queue. A super queue works as a collection of work queues. Um, the idea is that um, you would use a super queue when you have a, a whole bunch of work queues that require a very similar configuration, typically security being the only thing that's different. Um, you know, as you go through and design your 
uh, workflow queue columns um, that can get very tedious with uh, a whole bunch of end user queues that need those configured appropriately. If they're all going to be configured the same way, there's um, the best way to do that would be to throw everything into a giant super queue. You create a whole bunch of sub queues under that and then configure that workflow queue appearance just once and that'll kind of trickle down into everything inside of the super queue. So you'll notice here within my workflow, I have a whole bunch of these work queues and then a whole bunch of, or and a couple of these uh, super queues, um, just to kind of show you uh, how, how you can use those in between, or how you can use those interchangeably. Um, in addition to the queues, the next big thing are routes. Within the routes, the, again, uh, only two of them are really commonly used. Those are the sequential routes and the auto routes, the auto sequential routes. Um, the difference being really just the color, the the green routes and the black routes. I like to think of the green routes as your happy path within the workflow. Um, you can only have one auto route between queue to queue. Um, so uh, if, if a document were to come here, the script would fire off. Um, once the uh, once the document seems successful, it'll just kind of follow this green path. But you'll notice here, um, within this queue, there are multiple destinations. None of them are greater than the other. Um, it's just that uh, depending on whatever rule we have configured here, the other, so all of these are just going to be your regular sequential routes. Um, but from all of these queues, the destination, um, if everything is deemed successful, should come to this queue, which is why these are all green here. Um, within the scripting, uh, within you, when you do your I scripting, you can also kind of configure these to route to the auto route, whatever is configured on the queue, as opposed to specifying a specific queue name or a queue ID. Um, the other two, parallel and load balancing, those are exactly what you think they are. They're not used too terribly often. Um, but kind of moving on, um, within the top left corner of the queues, you'll notice some of these actions specified here. Uh, the difference between this green uh, triangle versus this blue square um, is really just the inbound action versus a kind of within queue action. Um, if we go ahead and open up one of these queues um, to give us these queue properties, Within these queue properties, you'll notice the actions section. Within the actions, you have your inbound action, your within action, and your outbound action. Uh, typically with a script, best practice is always to make those an inbound action. Um, so as a document enters the queue, the script gets kicked off. Um, the script has context as to which workflow item is being uh, invoked. Uh, so then uh, at that point, the script can just perform its action on that specific document before uh, either routing it or whatever action we have configured for that script to do. Um, outside of iScripting, the next most common thing is really just routing rules. Routing rules will always start with, as an inbound queue action. Um, routing rules allow you to kind of determine what happen, what needs to happen with those queues. So for instance, this one right here is a routing rule. It's going to route the document into one of these linking queues. Um, and I think the rule here is set based on a document type or a specific drawer combination. Um, you can do all of that without any scripting experience. Um, that's all done within this workflow designer um, and allows you to, it's pretty flexible, but if you need a little bit more uh, functionality, that's where we would kind of go down that iScript path. Within these, queue act, within these queue properties, um, we do have the ability to set alarms. Um, so alarms on the queue, we can have it set so that if a, the queue count is greater than one or greater than five, send an email to a specific user to let them know. This is specifically useful for exception queues, error handling queues, workflows that aren't really used too often, um, that you want like some sort of alert to tell you that, hey, an item is in this queue and something needs to happen to it. Um, I mentioned workflow appearances. Uh, those are your queue column appearances. So here, uh, to the end user, if you select preview, it'll kind of show you what these queue columns are going to look like to those end users from here. It's just your typical columns configuration with an image now. You can drag items, sort items, add items into the columns as well. Um, and then kind of on top of that, we have applications and forms. Uh, applications is how you would tie an application plan to a queue, and form is how you would tie those e-forms to those queues as well. Now that was a pretty high level overview of kind of some of these workflow options within the workflow designer. Uh, thank you for watching this RPI resource video and I hope you learned something new. You can find more RPI resources, including videos like these, at rpic.com. For more information, contact us today at rpi at rpic.com. Thank you.